handwritten note on a scrappy piece of paper would lead police to a murder site and a two-year investigation to find the killer. Along the way, another woman would die and three families would be torn apart forever. Why has he done that? How could he have done that? The more we tried to find out who she was, the less information we were getting. The ability of a particular piece of evidence to show that one person was responsible is highly specific. We really didn't have any idea as to who might have been the offender. I was quite convinced by that time that I needed to contact the police. I can't really find the words to describe just how bad it makes you feel. It's, it's a dreadful feeling. The question that we were asking ourselves, was the offender keeping an eye on the police investigation? All I wanted to know is who killed her and how the killer looks like. I think that this is going to be a suspicious one. The first few weeks of April 1999 were a busy time for police in Adelaide. One of the biggest events on the car racing calendar was on and thousands of people from around Australia flocked to the capital. As crowds began to dwindle, two police officers hoped their shift would be a little more routine. But it wasn't to be. The patrol officers found a note on the windscreen and this note directed them to the old Payne and Police Station and that they may find the body of a woman there and that it was no joke. They immediately went down and in the bushes, they did in fact find the body of a young woman. It looked like the body had been there for some time because it was in an advanced state of decomposition. Tonight, a body dumped at an old police station but unnoticed for days. The grisly discovery was made just before 11 last night. The woman's badly decomposed body was partially hidden by bushes in the front yard of the old station. Police say she'd been murdered. Because of the arrangement of the clothing, her jeans had been pulled down and her panties had also been removed. There was a distinct suggestion that there had been some sexual offence committed prior to her death. When you go to a scene, basically what the investigating police want to know is the manner of death. And when I looked at that case, it was immediately apparent that it was a homicide they were dealing with. It was a sexual assault homicide from behind. And the reason I say that is the upper clothing that remained on the body included a quilted shirt and the quilted shirt had been twisted tightly around the neck and that indicated that the cause of death was uh, strangulation by her own clothing, strangulation by ligature. Apart from how she died, police needed answers to two other important questions. Who the victim was and could they get any estimate on when she died? Pathologists are quite good at identifying intervals since death in that first 24 hours. But in this case, the death was obviously a long time before that. The body was heavily infested with various forms of insect activity, so I knew that I couldn't help them. I knew it was important, but I couldn't help them, so I asked them to get an entomologist out of the scene. Establishing the time of death uh, is critical. Uh, and on this particular occasion, there were maggots on the body, which is a rather gruesome uh, part of any uh, murder investigation. But from a scientific and forensic point of view, the maggots can determine pretty much the exact time of death. When I took the maggots that I'd collected from the murder victim's body back to the laboratory, I went about in the first place identifying the species of flies that they represented to determine how long I thought those maggots had been in the body of the victim based on the likely temperature conditions that the maggots had experienced. The warmer it is, the quicker maggots will develop. So here I relied upon temperatures from the body as well as temperatures from the Bureau of Meteorology. However, 
about the weather conditions in the uh, area uh, during the likely time that the body had been lying there. I estimated that the body had become infested by flies sometime during the morning of the 13th of April. It meant that the victim had been murdered the night before, on Monday the 12th of April, some five days before her body was found. With regard to who the deceased was, she had no personal effects. We didn't know other than the fact that she was obviously a young adult female with blonde hair. We didn't know who she was. But when I did the post-mortem, she had three missing teeth in the upper jaw and she had a number of gold restorations. And they were sufficiently odd that they would identify the deceased, providing someone reported her missing. The victim is described as approximately uh, 162 centimetres, 5 foot 4 inches tall. She had shoulder length fair hair. There were a number of females reported missing and similar in description, but because of the approximate age and the general description, that narrowed down to a lady who had been reported missing, Maya Chakik. Apart from her age, height and hair colour, the missing persons report also indicated that the 30-year-old lived nearby to the crime scene. And more importantly, she wore a dental plate to hide three missing teeth. The experts examined the actual dental records and they were able to say that positively it was Maya Jackick. But Maya had been missing since the 6th of April, six days before the entomologist believed she had been murdered. So where had she been? It was important to try and track her movements. Where had Maya been uh, in, in the previous week? Uh, who had she been mixing with? Uh, because uh, any of those people uh, might have been suspects, uh, could provide a motive uh, for the murder. What police were yet to realise was that on the same night she was strangled to death, the murderer had contacted them. Yeah, there seems to be a, a body uh, of some sort in the bushes there. I'm not so sure. I haven't gone near it. Where are you ringing from? When the decomposed body of a young woman was found hidden among bushes, the manner of death was clear. She had been sexually assaulted and then strangled to death with her own clothing. But her identity was only made possible because of three missing teeth. I just cooked my dinner and I was putting a dinner on the table. We watched the news. And what I saw was a huge shock to me. Mayor Jackick's body was discovered on Saturday night after a note was left on the windscreen of a patrol car at the Norwood police station. I just couldn't believe. I almost died of shock because I spoke to her mum just a few days ago. We're looking for her. Her mum was a couple of times a day passing the place where her body was covered with the branches without knowing that her daughter's body was lying on, on the ground. According to the forensic entomologist, Maya's body had been lying there for five days. Her mother, however, had reported her missing six days before that time. So it was vital for the detectives to piece together her last movements. Shortly after we'd established who the victim was, the investigation went to trying to obtain any information we could about Moya Jackick, her background, who knew her. It was very difficult because the more we tried to find out, the less information we were getting. There were dozens of people who actually knew her, but when it came down to who in fact she was or what they knew about her, they really knew nothing about her and all the information we were getting was that she was wandering between Glenelg, the city and her home at all times of the day and night. Maya was well known to proprietors at the Martin Shopping Centre where until about a month ago she was seen almost every day. They've spoken of a quiet but polite girl who always kept to herself. I don't know exactly what she was doing around here but I think only once in the past ten months I'd seen her with, uh, with a friend. She didn't have many friends. I was like her last resort for everything. She didn't mix much with other people, no. Deep down, um, I think she was lonely. I think that maybe she had a little depression or something. And she didn't want to talk about that. I used to call her, you know, Maya, talk to me. Oh, she just didn't want to talk. All I wanted to know is who killed her, 
and how the killer looks like. How, how somebody can do such a thing? So far, the identity of the killer, like Maya's last days, remained a mystery. The note on the police car revealed no fingerprints. Detectives hoped the post-mortem would lead them to a suspect. The importance of a sexual assault homicide these days is the DNA databank. With DNA technology, the ability of a particular piece of evidence to show that one person and no one else was responsible is highly specific. So our expectations, at least at that stage, were that we might find seminal fluid or hairs or fibres or any other contact trace evidence. But all the smears and swabs that I'd collected at the post-mortem came back negative. No DNA was found. In other words, no seminal fluid was identified. Now, the reasons for that can be uh, many and varied. Uh, perhaps that um, uh, there was no uh, sexual contact, although we suspected that was unlikely to be the case. Uh, but uh, perhaps the advanced uh, state of decomposition uh, can impact on that. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, we were not able to get any DNA. The killer, it seemed, was totally without trace. He could be anyone and be anywhere. And at the time of the murder, there was a race in town. He's going to get a rousing reception. Look at that go up. Craig Lowndes takes out leg one of the Adelaide 500. The Adelaide 500 racing carnival brought people from all over Australia, indeed uh, from all over the world. It was the gutsy V8 supercar race the crowd had come to see. Visual programs here. The place is electric. So this complicated the investigation, uh, given that we really didn't have any idea as to who might have been the, the offender. But then a breakthrough. Police learned that a call had come through on their hotline on the night the entomologist believed Maya had been murdered. Police emergency. Hello. Hello. Yeah, there's uh, someone hanging around the old uh, Payne and Police Station. Uh, seems to be uh, finally uh, breaking down, thank you. That particular person was very, very important to the investigation because he certainly knew or saw something. And then, lo and behold, a short time later, we had information that came forward in relation to another triple O call where the ambulance was called. Ambulance service. Yeah, you walk past the old Payne and Police Station. There seems to be a, a body uh, of some sort in the bushes there. I'm not too sure. That call was also made on the Monday night. Payne and Rose. I haven't gone near it. Stuff off uh, Payne and Rose there. In both instances, the police and paramedics went to the old police station mentioned by the caller. But there was no break and enter or a body, and the calls were dismissed as hoaxes. Five days later, the note appeared, and fortunately, they didn't go to the old police station but came here to the old patrol base where they found Maya's body in the bushes. I think that we were in little doubt once we'd learned of the two triple O calls and the note that they were all the, or the one person was responsible for all of them. Uh, and it was uh, fairly unlikely in our view that that person was an innocent bystander. Uh, we suspected that that person uh, was in fact the offender. Right, we'll uh, get on ahead. What's your name? Uh, one because we can track the triple O calls. The first was made from a phone box quite near to where Maya's body had been located. The other triple O call was made from a phone box near the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Where are you ringing from? A phone box. In the Adelaide? Yep. In the Royal Adelaide? Yep. So how do you know what's happening out of Payneham there? Well, I've just seen them. there was a body there about half an hour ago. Alright, uh, you didn't stop to see what was happening there? No. No, alright, we'll uh, get on ahead. What's your name? Uh, I won't say, it's a catch no anyway. What's that? The question that we were asking ourselves, was the offender uh, keeping an eye on the police investigation? Um, was he uh, waiting and watching for the police? 30-year-old Maya Jarkic had been strangled to death. Her body left in the bushes outside an old police patrol base. The killer had called police twice on the night he murdered her. And then five days later, police believed the same person placed a note on their patrol car. But while he left the note, he left no clues to his identity, except his voice. 
Yeah, just walked past the old Pain and Police Station. There seems to be a, a body. We had to try and get that voice on the Triple O call out to the public. It's not something that we've done before, a uh, release a call from, um, from Crime Stoppers. But it was so important on this occasion, we believe that was the correct course. This is Seven Nightly News with Graham Goodings and Jane Doyle. Tonight, the tape police hope will help catch a killer. Police are asking you to watch and listen to our first story very carefully. We're going to show you a note sent to police and play an audio tape, either of which may lead to the killer of Mayor Jackick, whose body was found at Paynham last month. Hello. Hello. Yeah, there's uh, someone hanging around the old uh, Paynham police station. It's uh, interesting for you to finally uh, break in there, I think. The voice of the man police believe holds vital clues in the Mayor Jackick murder case. Major crime detectives have taken the extraordinary moves of releasing the tapes and note in a desperate attempt to get public help. Well, we're certainly hoping that someone perhaps uh, recognises the voice. Anyone with information is asked to call Bank SA Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. Hundreds of calls came in, but there were no solid leads. We had hundreds of calls in respect to those two areas. People saying that the caller was someone they went to school with, next door neighbours, a variety of reasons why they thought the voice was someone and the author was someone else. But uh, unfortunately, it got us nowhere. Two weeks later, they tried again. With information drying up, detectives have again appealed for a mystery triple O phone caller to make contact with them and tell them what he knows. Even a reward for $100,000 couldn't do the trick. Unfortunately, some of these investigations that do reach a stage where you've followed absolutely every possible line of inquiry, uh, and each line of inquiry uh, becomes a dead end. The case remained open, but was scaled down. Two years on from Maya's murder, the team were now occupied with another mystery, the disappearance of 18-year-old Megumi Suzuki. Megumi had left her residence on Friday, August the 3rd at 7.41am. She headed to school and the security video showed her leaving at 8 minutes past 3 in the afternoon. Our initial information was that the last time that Megumi was seen uh, alive was on the Friday afternoon uh, down the Rundle Mall uh, having some coffee with some friends. And the last person who she spoke to, she said that she believed that uh, Megami was going to Grenfell Street to catch the O-Burn back to the place where she was living. But it appeared Megumi never made it home on that Friday night. I did phone her residence and ask if they could um, see if she was there. They said no, she wasn't in the room and they said nothing had been touched, the bed hadn't been slept in and also it had been the census weekend, I don't know if you remember when everybody was counted and the census form was still there from the Friday night. So I was a bit concerned and I had emailed the parents as well by then her mother had said that she never went anywhere without her teddy bear. And I knew then that there was something very wrong. I telephoned her boyfriend, her ex-boyfriend, to find out if he had heard from her. And he said no, he hadn't. And he had been worried about her as well because it was unusual for him not to hear from her. So I was quite convinced by that time that I needed to contact the police, which I did first thing on Thursday morning. Megumi Suzuki was last seen by a friend at a city bus stop. Police began distributing missing person posters outside the Maya Centre late this afternoon. At this stage, uh, we didn't really know whether we had a homicide investigation uh, or simply a missing person. With posters, publicity and appeals in full swing, a man rang in with crucial evidence. He was a maintenance worker on the bus track that Megumi took home each weekday afternoon. And in the bushes nearby, he found her bag. There was an identification card with her picture on there. There were numerous books with her name on it and also a lot of her personal items. I think the finding of her school books was the first step we had to say, 
I think that this is going to be a suspicious one. It, it raised our concern that Magumi may have met with foul play. SES and Mounted Police scout the scrub. The police helicopter was also called in. There were a number of things actually missing from her possession, and one was her mobile phone. She also had a CD Walkman, which she always took with her, and that was also missing. But what they did find was her credit card and a bus ticket. And those two items took her to one place, a BP service station in the opposite direction of her home. So that alerted the investigators to the fact, well, why had she been travelling down there? Who might have she seen down there? And, and how might that information assist us in our investigation? The BP console operator could pinpoint from his records what time and exactly what she purchased. She had purchased uh, a SIM card for her telephone. That alerted us to her mobile phone. Uh, we were able to then do some, uh, some checks on the uh, call charge records. Megumi made 12 calls that night. The last, a text message, sent to her ex-boyfriend, who lived only a stone's throw away from the BP station. It was fairly obvious now as to what was motivating Magumi to be at that particular location at that time. It was to go and see the boyfriend. The last known sighting of 18-year-old Magumi Suzuki was at a BP station where she had bought a phone card. The records showed her last call was a text message to her ex-boyfriend. We knew at that stage that he lived in the very near vicinity of the BP service station. We actually spoke to him and he was uh, with friends at another location that night. I think it was the picture show. He was um, very, very helpful in our investigation. He was uh, distraught uh, and was uh, making every attempt to assist the police in trying to locate um, Megumi. It was about a week later that he contacted police uh, with a piece of uh, underclothing, in fact uh, a pair of pants, uh, that he suspected may have belonged to Megumi. So it was important to determine and confirm, were they Megumi's? In her room at the student residence, detectives found underwear of similar styles. The distinguishing factor that did stand out was the fact that all her underwear, or the majority of her underwear, were all matching sets. The bra that matched those pants wasn't located but through uh, subsequent uh, forensic testing, we were able to get a DNA match and confirm positively that they, they were her clothes. It was a worrying sign, more so as her pants had seemed to appear out of thin air, just like the note on the patrol car. It was interesting as to how did those pants get there? Uh, were they uh, placed there? Did they blow there by the weather? But with no real evidence that Megumi had met with foul play, all the police could do was keep asking the public for their help. Police will begin targeting city nightclubs as part of their search for missing Japanese student Megumi Suzuki. Police will hand out the posters this weekend to the city's dance and karaoke clubs, where Megumi was a regular. Although we have grave fears, uh, at this stage I think that there is still a glimmer of hope. We will continue to work on that basis. Megumi's parents have flown from Tokyo. They've released a statement thanking police and appealing for more information to help find their daughter. We love our daughter very much. We pray that in the coming hours there will be some positive news. And it appeared their prayers were answered. The witness and his wife claims they were only metres away from the missing student outside the Akaba Hotel at 11.30 this morning. A dozen police patrol cars converged on the area. Streets surrounding the Howard Flory Reserve were blocked off as the dog squad and uniform patrols thoroughly checked homes and questioned residents. This particular sighting was from a person uh, who knew Megumi um, and uh, was uh, associated with uh, her accommodation. I actually spoke to him myself and other detectives spoke to him. We were satisfied that he believed the person he saw was Megumi. And as a result of that, we thought, well, hello, yes, she's still alive. I'm just glad that she's been sighted because uh, she's not dead. That's the main thing. That's good news. 
good for her parents to know that she's OK and safe and sound. You, you wouldn't want to be in that position yourself. The parents of missing teenager Megumi Suzuki have made an emotional plea to their daughter to come forward to police. Megumi, Megumi, if you saw this, please come forward as soon as possible. Father and mother can sleep every day. Don't worry about anything. Please come forward as soon as possible. Father and mother will protect you from now on. Please come forward. But Megumi never made contact, and there were no more sightings. At the one moment we thought that she might still be alive, then those hopes were dashed. It was a roller coaster ride to us. Uh, we can only try and imagine uh, the roller coaster ride that the parents uh, were on at that particular point in time. Eight weeks after Megumi had gone missing, her photo was put onto a new police website that had just been developed. Uh, and uh, on that same website, uh, we were able to place uh, the unsolved murder uh, of Maya Jackick. The police are also making a new bid to solve the murder of 30-year-old Maya Jackich, whose body was found over two years ago. Detectives have turned to the internet, trying to identify the man who made two emergency calls on the night of her murder. Yeah, I just walked past the old Payne and police station. There seems to be a, a body of some sort in the police room. People could um, uh, dial onto the internet uh, and listen to that call from indeed anywhere in Australia or perhaps anywhere in the world. Uh, so that uh, wider exposure, we thought, uh, was both uh, innovative uh, and critical in trying to get that breakthrough that we needed. The strategy would work. Police were about to find out the long-needed identity of the caller and Maya's killer. I listened to it about half a dozen times. I closed my eyes and listened to it. And I could see Mark talking to me. Police knew that the killer of Maya Jakic was most likely the same person who made two emergency calls on the night that Maya was murdered. Who he was had eluded them. That was until the internet pulled him into its web. The following is a taped voice of a male person who contacted police and ambulance triple O facilities. During the and one particular person heard his voice. Police are seeking your assistance to identify the caller. I logged on and found the tape and listened to it. And listened to it. And listened to it. And I listened to it about half a dozen times. I closed my eyes and listened to it. Yeah, I just walked past the old Payne and police station. There seems to be a, a body. And I was 90% sure that it was my brother. Perhaps Mark was involved with this crime that seemed rather out of character for Mark. He'd never been violent as far as I knew. So I listened to the tape again. And I remember I walked up the passageway a little bit and closed my eyes so there was some distance from the voice. I don't know, I just see him. He's got a flashlight flashing around the place. Inside or? Yeah, uh, you know, in and around the place. And I could see Mark talking to me where I could hear that voice. So I sort of decided then that I had to ring Crime Stoppers. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It's, um, there's no damage done. But if I'm on, if I'm right, well, they need to know about it. Stephen Rust said that he'd been away for a number of years and had just come back. He's seen the publicity, he heard the voice. Yeah, there's um, someone hanging around the old uh, Payne and Police Station. And I could see the dilemma he was going through because here he was identifying the voice as being that of his brother, Mark Rust. Mark Rust was certainly known to us. We had his name in our files for more minor uh, sexual offences. It was um, a rather sickening feeling to realise that perhaps Mark had stepped over the line because he'd been in trouble for such a long time with the police and going to jail and parole, the family knew that he was building up and getting worse each time and that eventually he would do something really terrible and end up in jail for the rest of his life. But at the same time, we'd always hoped that, you know, he wouldn't go, go that way. So when 
it was fairly certain that it was Mark who was involved. Um, it was it was a nasty feeling. It was left a very unpleasant taste. While the police were convinced the triple O caller was Mark Rust, it wasn't enough to make an arrest. They would also need to prove that the note left on the patrol car was his handiwork. And Stephen Rust had provided them with a letter from his brother for comparison. Our task was to look at the, um, the handwriting and see if it had been written by the person. One of the more outstanding uh, features was the double cross on the T, which was a, um, a, a feature of both the specimen letter and the, the question note. Another feature was the way that the uh, letters were spaced uh, in the word, for example, in the word good, they were very tight and overlapping. And all of the words, particularly where they could be directly compared, words like the and of, um, and these were very similar in their appearance. In general, every single letter, every single word that could be directly compared showed very close similarities in both their uh, form and in their appearance. I was convinced that the same person had written both the letter um, that was found on the patrol car and the, the specimen letter. So after assessing uh, all of the evidence, uh, we were satisfied that we had a reasonable case uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, the detectives went out and made the arrest. A 37-year-old man has been arrested and charged with the murder of Maya Jakic two years after she died. Late yesterday afternoon in Port Augusta, detectives arrested and charged a man. They had found Mark in jail. His minor sexual offences had progressed to rape and he was currently on remand in a prison some 300 kilometres away from where Maya was murdered. Police don't believe there was any relationship between Miss Jakic and the accused. Her parents in Croatia have been contacted by detectives and say they're very pleased about the arrest. Shortly after Mark Rust was charged and went back to the prison at Port Augusta, he obviously needed someone to confide in because he was probably shocked that he was eventually arrested. This resulted in an informant contacting us who passed on some very valuable information. Mark had remained silent when he had been questioned and then charged with Maya's murder. It was a different story back at the prison. The informant said that Mark had told him that he saw a tall, blonde girl walking along Paynham Road. He spoke to her. The struggle ensued and then he pulled her into the bushes where he had sex with her and he eventually ended up strangling her. But it was what the informant told the police next that was totally unexpected. As a result, we had to move very quickly uh, and make a search of uh, Mark Russ's uh, cell and his uh, belongings. What they were looking for and found was a CD player. A CD player similar in shape and colour to the one that missing school student Megumi Suzuki had with her on the day she disappeared. We contacted the mother in Japan and she was in a situation where she could produce all the relevant document dating back and tracing that sale with the serial number to her and Megumi in Japan. Of course, finding a rust in possession uh, of uh, some of Megumi's property didn't in itself uh, mean that uh, he'd committed the murder. So uh, whilst it was an important part, there was still a lot more work to be done uh, by the team of investigators. 37-year-old Mark Rust had been arrested and charged with the murder of Maya Jakic. His brother had identified his voice as that of the triple-O caller, and a sample of his writing matched exactly that of the note left on the police car. Now Mark was a suspect in the murder of 18-year-old Megumi Suzuki. Her CD Walkman had been found in his cell after an informant contacted the police. The informant also said in relation to Suzuki that he approached her. He had sex with her and he said to her, don't look at me, whatever you do. She looked at him, saw his face and as a result he attempted to strangle her. And then he actually killed her by 
hitting her on the head with a rock. We were also told that uh, Megami had been murdered on a vacant paddock and that he had burnt clothing or something there. As a result of the information, we went back to the BP service station. Directly opposite was a vacant block of land. We made a search of the vacant block of land and we found the seat of a fire. The fire brigade was contacted. They confirmed they had put out a small fire on that vacant lot on the very night Megumi had disappeared. Near the fire, we found a rock which could possibly have been used in the offence. We found bits of burnt clothing and arm bracelets, and we knew that these were jewellery worn by Megumi Suzuki. But Megumi's body had yet to be found. The only clue from the informant was that Mark Rust had dumped her into an industrial bin. We combed the area uh, based on some directions that were provided, uh, and uh, we did in fact find a bin um, at the uh, rear of uh, some premises on Goodwood Road. The circumstantial evidence against Mark Rust was stacking up. But before they could make an arrest, the investigators needed to be absolutely sure that this was the bin where Mark had placed Megumi after he killed her. And they turned to the Rust family for help. This must have been an enormous dilemma for them uh, to assist the police uh, in effect uh, to establish and clarify whether um, Mark Rust was responsible. Nevertheless, they did provide that assistance and they were able to confirm that the waste bin uh, had uh, a hippo on the side. The bin that we were looking at had similar markings uh, and that was the final lead that we needed to satisfy that we had a reasonable case to arrest Rust. I was shocked about the My Jackage thing because it just came out of the blue and really sort of, you know, knocked the wind out of our sails. Um, and then when Jerry told us about Nagumi Suzuki, it just fitted together very nicely with what Mark had been doing. So I, I sort of believed it pretty much straight away. Megumi's body hasn't been found, but it's understood it may have been dumped in an industrial bin and later at the Wingfield rubbish tip. We have been praying for our daughter to be alive under any circumstances for the last three months. But this week we received the saddest news we could have had. When they arrived out in Australia, um, Jerry Feltus um, took them down to the rubbish dump. And I think that that was uh, obviously a very, very traumatic moment for the parents to sit on the side of uh, uh, a rubbish tip, knowing that somewhere amongst uh, literally hundreds of tonnes of rubbish uh, there was the body of your daughter. So we certainly felt obligated to try and do everything possible to recover Megumi's body, and that was the next challenge for us. But first, the grisly search for the murdered Japanese student, 18-year-old Megumi Suzuki, has begun at a Wingfield landfill site. Megumi was dumped at the site nearly four months before, so numerous layers of baled rubbish were discarded until the level they believed she would be in was located. Then those bales were broken apart and searched. We had to go through every bale. We were looking for things that related back to the particular date. We had to go through newspapers, invoices, everything with dates on it to ensure that we were in the correct area and we weren't moving out of it. You were going through trying to find things which kept you on track. And after 11 days, and after removing tens of thousands of tonnes of rubbish, they were in the exact spot, and Megumi's body was found. There was a mixture of relief uh, and, uh, and, and sorrow to think that uh, someone could meet such an untimely death in the way that Megumi was murdered and then to have a body dumped in the location that it was dumped was absolutely horrific. The amazing thing about finding the body of Megumi Suzuki is that she still had her boots on, she still had clothing on and the bra that she was wearing was an identical match to the pants which her ex-boyfriend had found in the laneway months earlier near the vacant block of land. 
We believe that our daughter was found, thanks to the efforts of everyone involved in her search. We realize it was a very difficult task considering the circumstances. It is no exaggeration to say it was a miracle to find her so quickly. But Rust's confession to murdering Megumi didn't come quickly. He maintained his innocence, as he did for the murder of Maya Jakic. Then, exactly one year after Megumi's body was found, he changed his plea. There's been a shock development in the murder of Japanese student Megumi Suzuki. A 37-year-old man from the northeastern suburbs has pleaded guilty. I know that you've done this. You know you've done it. And you need to put your hand up for it so that there's not a big court case. These poor families aren't dragged through this muck and we can all get over it as best we can and bring some closure to everyone's life. Six months later, Mark Rust also admitted to the murder of Maya Jakic on the 12th of April, 1999. The families of two young women brutally murdered by a homicidal predator have given harrowing accounts of the loss of their loved ones. On behalf of the families, friends gave heartbreaking accounts of how the murders have totally devastated dozens of lives. Fulse Simpson described the Suzuki family's anguish, quoting Megumi's mother, it makes me insane when I think of her being treated like rubbish. Ida Gregov related the thoughts of Maya's mother, Yagada. Why would anyone want to kill Maya like an innocent bird and cover her with branches and cover his dirty crime? I've done it with all my heart. And I did call Maya's mom and I said, this is what I've done. I actually spoke on your behalf and I saw the killer and it's done, I said, it's finished. Mark Rust was sentenced to life in jail without parole for both murders. The judge ruled that the 39-year-old was incapable of controlling his sexual urges and would be detained until further order. You ask yourself, why has he done that? How could he have done that? Because we all grew up together in the same house. It's emotionally quite devastating to realise that someone so close to you and in your immediate family can commit such a crime. It's really... It's, it's devastating. It's... it's um, I don't know, I can't really find, find the words to describe just how, how bad it makes you feel. It's, it's a dreadful feeling. The Suzuki family are still very distressed they are really feeling it at the moment because uh, they had great expectations for their daughter. Maya's mother took her daughter's body back to Croatia, where she visits the grave every day. We both lost a very, very special person. A lovely daughter and the most beautiful friend I ever had. For once she can rest in peace.